Oral questions, questions orales, the Honorable Opposition House Leader. various regions in Ontario, Quebec and New Brunswick are dealing with severe flooding, we are all very concerned for the lives, families and businesses that are being impacted by the high water. I know we're all grateful to the thousands of volunteers, first responders and the Canadian Armed Forces who are working around the clock trying to keep people and their property safe. Can the government provide this House with an update on the current situation and inform us as to what immediate actions are being taken to assist those who are affected by the current flooding? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are standing shoulder to shoulder in combating dangerous and damaging floods this spring across four provinces. The provinces have, of course, the frontline jurisdiction for emergency response, but when they need help, they make a specific request to the Government of Canada, and we have responded quickly and positively in every case. I've spoken with Minister Eckhart in New Brunswick, Minister Guibault in Quebec, and Minister Jones in Ontario. Our collaboration in response has been seamless. All governments and thousands of volunteers will continue to work together to help to support one another, because that's what Canadians do. Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, the canola crisis with China has been ongoing for over a month now, and it's been devastating for Canadian producers. But our Prime Minister has been so embroiled in, in his SNC-Lavalin scandal that he hasn't offered any solutions. Sadly, he doesn't even appear to know the difference between China and Japan. He's been more consumed with saving his own political skin rather than addressing the real issues that Canadians are facing. What will the Prime Minister do for canola farmers who are facing this immediate and this growing crisis? Mr. Speaker, we are standing shoulder to shoulder with our canola farmers from the very beginning, and we stand with them and their families. We know we have the best canola in the world, we have a very robust inspection system, and we have ongoing conversation with the Chinese authority to resolve this issue as quickly as we can. We remain committed to... to, to uh, of this issue, and we are also looking at the best way to support even more our farmers. We look forward to have more to say soon. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Conservatives have been meeting and consulting with leaders and members of the ag sector, and earlier today, our leader put forward concrete proposals to address the crisis situate the canola crisis. Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, are happy to do the work and offer solutions, while the Prime Minister and the Liberals are clearly asleep at the yeah. wheel. Yeah. Our plan offers real solutions and it has the support of canola producers. So, will the Prime Minister take the work that we've done and implement these proposals immediately? Here. Mr. Speaker, actually, we were working on this issue from the first day. While our Conservatives colleagues were keeping asking questions on other issues, it took them six weeks to ask that first question on the canola issue. I'm working, our team is working with the industry, with our provincial colleagues, with the businesses involved, with the farmers for more than two months now. We are there standing by our farmers and their families since the beginning. It's difficult to hear the answer when the member, honourable member for Prince Albert is yelling out throughout the answer. I'd ask him uh, to restrain himself and show respect for this House order. Seven weeks ahead, and I know we can manage to contain ourselves. I'm happy to do that. The honourable member for Megantic Clérable. Nine times to have an emergency debate on the canola thing, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, the government's inaction on canola is costing the economy dearly. It's been almost two months, two months, that Richardson's uh, permit was uh, cancelled. And what's the government done? Absolutely nothing. It's just waiting for the crisis to resolve itself. Will the Prime Minister listen to the Leader of the Opposition and one 
appoint an ambassador, uh, provide emergency funding to farmers, and to lodge an official trade complaint against the Chinese government? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, we have been working on this file since the very beginning. It took seven weeks before the member for Mégantic Lérable to put uh, his first question on canola to me. Since the very beginning, I've been working with our producers, farmers, with the industry, with our colleagues uh, in the provinces, with companies uh, that are directly affected. We've put together a working committee. We are looking at all the options, and I will have some good news to announce uh, shortly to uh, further assist our producers. The Honourable Member for mégantic lérable The Minister of the Agriculture it has refused to talk about the crisis at committee since before Christmas, Mr. Speaker. They don't want to talk about it there. For a month, we've talked about a technical delegation. China has been completely ignoring the Liberal government. Today, we've learned that the crisis will extend to additional commodities. Maybe the minister has time to wait, but our producers don't. They don't have time to wait, Mr. Speaker. Will the prime minister listen to the leader of the opposition, appoint an ambassador, increase assistance to producers, and launch an official trade complaint against China? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, since I was appointed to my new position since March 1st, I have worked hard on this file as a team with my uh, colleague, the Minister for Trade Diversification, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, others, our counterparts in the provinces. We have worked together tirelessly to, to continue the technical uh, conversations through th with the inspection agency and with Chinese authorities. We are supporting our producers. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the scandal around the Prime Minister's role in political interference has shown Canadians Liberals have one set of rules for their powerful friends and another for everyone else. It's not just shielding a giant corporation from criminal prosecution. KPNG was let off the hook for tax avoidance. Sears financiers were protected, but workers were not. And pharmaceutical companies were put ahead of Canadians unable to afford the medication. Will Liberals now change their course and help people by implementing our plan for Pharmacare for All? Here, here. The Honourable the Minister of International Trade Diversification. Mr. Speaker, while Canadians are proud of their health care system, we believe that no one should have to choose between paying for prescriptions and putting food on the table. Yes. That's why we're laying the foundation for National Pharmacare with several bold, concrete steps in Budget 2019 that could lower drug costs by up to $3 billion a year. Action. We look forward to continuing this progress when we receive the Pharmacare Council's final report in the coming months. Honourable member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, that answer was an embarrassment. Yeah. Yes. Liberals are also missing an opportunity for Canada to become a leader in the green economy and instead continue to pile billions on billions in corporate welfare to highly profitable companies. Investing in a green economy can create thousands of jobs while fighting climate change. Let's start by helping Canadians reduce their carbon footprint and their monthly bills. Will Liberals stop subsidizing old companies, stop giving millions to Loblaws, and instead agree to our plan to retrofit all homes by 2050? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Speaker, we have uh, developed a comprehensive plan to address carbon emissions across this country that focuses not only on reducing emissions and adapting to some of the changes that we're already seeing in climate change, but focusing very much on generating the new economy. As somebody who actually spent 20 years as a CEO, Oh, in the green tech area, I understand this area very well. This, guy, this government has a comprehensive plan to ensure that we are addressing this on a go-forward basis in a responsible and thoughtful way. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, rich corporations have long had someone on their side, and people are paying the price. People deserve a government that's on their side. But the Liberal government has maintained the Conservative billion-dollar subsidies to oil and gas companies. That's unacceptable. To protect our environment and help people, when will the Liberals 
put an end to these subsidies. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries. Mr. Speaker, we have taken a great deal of action to fight climate change. We have taken steps to address greenhouse gas emissions. We are focusing on the economy and we have a plan to deal with climate change. We are showing leadership and we will continue to do so in the future. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, that answer is unacceptable. It's high time for the government to work for the people and not for the richest people. It's not by giving millions of dollars to rich, the richest, in fact, corporations that we'll be able to fight climate change. Our families and workers need help. When will the Liberal government acknowledge its mistake and reinvest the $12 million to help workers and their families? The Honourable Minister, our pl plan was developed in conjunction with the Canadians. It's a serious and affordable plan that will ensure uh, results. We have a plan to fight climate change and to make the economy clean for all. We have put in place over 50 measures. Canadians want real action and not the Conservative uh, action or the words of the NDP. Basca. The Honourable Member for Richmond Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is making our diplomatic relationships with China worse. We've got the canola crisis, the wrongful uh, detention of two Canadians following the Huawei affair on the weekend during a meeting with the Japanese Prime Minister. Imagine the uh, Prime Minister achieved the impossible. He confused, mixed up Japan and China in the same sentence. Not once, twice. What will the Prime Minister do to restore our diplomatic relations with China? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, our priority and my personal priority is the well-being and safety of Canadians detained in China. We have brought together an unprecedented unprecedented number of partners throughout the world to support Canada's position. The European Union, France, Australia, Great Britain, Holland, and I'll continue with the second question. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthur Baskey. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that the Prime Minister and government haven't offered any support to Canadian canola producers. The Prime Minister and his government haven't supported the two Canadians detained in China. The Prime Minister must immediately appoint an ambassador to China who can defend our nationals who are unfairly detained and restore stable trade and diplomatic relations. When will the Prime Minister show at least some leadership and responsibility? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'll continue with the list of the countries that have publicly supported Canada on this file. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Spain, Denmark, the United States, and 140 international academics and diplomats. The Secretary General at NATO directly and publicly called upon China to address our concerns and to take them seriously. Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, Canada is in the midst of the deepest diplomatic crisis we've ever experienced with China, and we have no ambassador on the ground. Ever since the Prime Minister's hand-picked Liberal insider had to re resign three months ago due to his own incompetence. The crisis gets worse each week, Mr. Speaker. Canadian citizens are in prison and are being mistreated. Exporters, including canola producers, are suffering. When will the Prime Minister step up and nominate a new ambassador to start turning this crisis around? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I would like to assure every member of this House and above all 
the detained Canadians that their well-being is our government's paramount priority and my paramount concern. We have rallied an unprecedented number of countries around the world to publicly speak out about these detained Canadians and to call for their release. And I'll give you the full list, Mr. Speaker, when I answer the next question. Honourable member for Durham. It's reassuring. She's already what her answer will be to my question, Mr. Speaker. I'll remind her the Prime Minister famously said that Canada is back. I'm sure that hollow liberal slogan is warm comfort to our two prisoners in, in China who have the lights on 24-7, Mr. Speaker. I'm not concerned about the other countries the minister is calling. I'd like her to speak to her Prime Minister. Will she answer this simple question? Will she appoint a new ambassador for China to stop or turn around this dispute by the end of the month, yes or no? Yeah. Order, the Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Sure, I am able to predict my answers because the questions are so easily predictable and repetitive. may not like questions or the answers, but we still have to hear them. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Carleton. The Prime Minister shattered his promise that the budget would balance itself this year. He's added three times as much debt as he said he would. The cost of government is up 25% in just over three years. Among the waste, wasteful spending is the quarter billion dollars for the Asian Infrastructure Bank to build pipelines and roads in China. Will the Prime Minister show even a modicum of respect for Canadian taxpayers and cancel that quarter billion dollar waste of money? Honourable Minister of Finance. We're pleased to make an investment into the Asian Infrastructure Bank. We know that that makes an important difference. There is, in fact, one project that that bank has taken on in China. It's a project to reduce the use of coal so that we can reduce pollution. The other projects, of course, are in less developed countries. And we think it's important to fund infrastructure around the world, which helps Canadian companies and helps our world be a more prosperous place. Here, here. There's far too much noise. This must not continue. There will be fewer questions. The Honourable Member for Carleton. The Prime Minister famously said that his favourite model of government was the basic Chinese dictatorship. In response, the Foreign Minister tells us the Chinese government gave him a nickname, Little Potato. <laughs> and to thank them for that, he gave a quarter billion tax dollars to the, tri to the Asian Infrastructure Bank to build pipelines and roads in that country that we can't even build in our own. Will the Prime Minister finally show some respect for Canadian tax dollars and cancel this quarter billion dollar handout to the Chinese government? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Finance. I continue to live in a world where facts matter. Again, there has been one investment by the Asian Infrastructure Bank in China to help them to get off coal, to reduce pollution. Now, we know this is important. We also know that the other investments that that bank is making around the less developed countries in Asia so they can actually improve their situation are critically important for our world. They're helpful for Canadian companies who are making those investments as well. We continue to support this infrastructure bank and we'll continue to work with those countries to improve their situation. Member for Timmins, James Bay. So I was back home talking with people about job and pension insecurity, talking with Kashetua and evacuees facing another year devastating floods and broken promises, and everyone said to me, explain, why did this Prime Minister give $12 million to Galen Weston to fix his fridges? This is a guy who lives in a gated community in Florida and fought against a living wage for his employees. It's the disconnect of this government. 
that offends people. Why is this Prime Minister preferring to act like a head butler for the uber-rich and the lobbyists rather than stand up for the interests of working-class Canadians? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Speaker, the Honourable Member has misconstrued our government's agenda, which is squarely to ensure that we create an economy that works for everyone. I have sat on panels with members of the NDP who have said that they support investments in energy efficiency. Now that we're actually doing it, they seem to oppose it. The fact is, the Low Carbon Economy Fund had officials from Environment and Climate Change Canada nominate 54 projects for funding through this fund based on what would achieve the greatest amount of emissions reductions at the lowest cost to Canadians. This investment is going to help reduce emissions, create jobs in places like Mississauga and 370 communities across our entire country. The Honourable Member. The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The problem is that this announcement had all the hallmarks of a government that was shopping around to participate in an announcement that was happening anyway, because Loblaws was moving ahead to uh, renovate their fridges anyway, and they wanted to be at the podium. That's the issue, Mr. Speaker. And the, question, and the problem is it's part of a theme of this government caving to corporate interests, as they did when they passed special legislation for SNC-Lavalin, while at the same time they were saying they needed a long, drawn-out consultation to see if it was worthwhile protecting the pensions of Sears workers and Stelco workers. So why isn't Canadian workers can't get the same protection for their pensions that SNC Lavalin gets from criminal charges? The Honourable Minister of Senior. Workplace pension security is a decades-old problem, and it's our government that committed the resources, the time and the energy to get this right. We are taking an evidence-based approach. We had consultations, and as a result of those consultations in Budget 2019, have introduced measures that are going to help our pensioners. We have created a process that's more fair, open and transparent. Executive bonuses, we heard a great deal about that. We've given the courts the power to set aside those executive bonuses when pensioners are compromised. Mr. Speaker, this is a very important file. We're going to continue to work hard to protect our pensions. Honourable. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Quartha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, three years of Liberal fumbles, failures and delays on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion have cost Canadians jobs and prosperity as investment flees the country. The Prime Minister moves heaven and earth to help his billionaire friends, but for struggling middle class families dependent on the energy sector, well, they can just wait and wait. Speaker, on what day will construction begin on the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Mr. Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, through you, let me take this opportunity to remind Canadians that it was the Conservative opposition members that voted to defund and kill Shameful. the process that we, that we have put in place for meaningful consultation with Indigenous communities. If they're really serious about expanding our energy sector and getting our resources to global markets, they should have supported their process so we can move forward in consultation with Indigenous peoples to move forward with the project in the right way. The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Mr. Speaker, construction season is upon us, but the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion lays dormant. As of today, there's no shovels in the ground, there's no jobs have been created, no community benefits are flowing. Gas prices are soaring sky high and people are hurting. This government spent $4.5 billion to buy a pipeline and now they can't even guarantee that it will be approved. This is insulting and the constituents don't like to be played for fools. On what date will construction begin? Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. We are following a path that has given to us by the Federal Court of Appeal, which means a process for meaningful consultation with Indigenous communities to get this project right, to listen to their concerns and offer them accommodation on their concerns. It was surprising to see the members of the opposition actually vote in favour of defunding and killing that process that we are following to get this project right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, the Prime 
Minister and the Finance Minister said they spent 4.5 billion tax dollars to buy the Trans Mountain Pipeline to start building the expansion quote immediately. Mm -hmm. It's now been over 11 months since Liberals told Canadians construction would begin quote right away. On what date will construction of the Trans Mountain expansion start? Oh, the Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, it's surprising that the Conservative would like to, like us, to follow a failed process that they followed for 10 years, that did not get a single pipeline built to get our resources to non-U.S. markets. 99% of the oil that we sell to the outside world is, gone, is going to one country, the United States. We need to expand our global market. In order to do that, we need to ensure that we follow the right process to move forward on projects such as Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion. Project. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, under Conservatives, four major pipelines were built with more access to new markets. And the reality is the Liberals already killed two pipelines. Three companies that wanted to build pipelines in Canada are gone, and not a single new inch of pipeline is in service right now. They said they spent 4.5 billion tax dollars to build the Trans Mountain expansion immediately. Now all we have to do is answer the questions. When will the Trans Mountain expansion be built? Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, I think uh, the Honourable Member very well knows that one of the projects she is talking about was actually the reversal of the existing pipeline. That's right. <laughs> if that is considered a new pipeline, I'm surprised what the definition of new pipeline is. Right? We are moving forward on the, in the right way on this process to ensure that we are consulting with Indigenous communities in a meaningful way, and we have extended the time over three weeks to give them enough time to ensure they are included in this process. Thank sure. you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain. Mr. Speaker, this government has abandoned steel workers once again. After steel safeguards expired last week, the Liberals failed to extend them for five crucial Canadian steel products. Now thousands of steel workers are left exposed to even more uncertainty thanks to a government that removed protections and has now allowed foreign dumping to flood our Canadian markets. The European Union has already put in place permanent safeguards. Instead of spending their time protecting the interests of their rich friends, why won't the government get to work and protect the jobs of Canadian steel workers? Honourable Minister of Finance. I see it as critically important that we do protect steel workers and the steel industry. We have said that we are moving forward with two safeguards as recommended by the CITT. We are clearly focused on how we can eliminate these unjust tariffs that have been imposed on us by the United States. And we've said that over the next 30 days we will work intensively with the industry to make sure that we can protect the industry and steel workers so that we can ensure that we have a long-term capacity in this sector. Honourable Member for Jonquière. There's hardly any time left, Mr. Speaker. Workers in Quebec, like the aluminum workers in my riding of Jonquière, have been living in uncertainty for several months. And now, steel workers will be facing the same uncertainty. Late Friday, the Liberals announced they won't permanently maintain safeguards for Canada's steel industry. Thousands of jobs are at stake. The Prime Minister reacts a lot more quickly when it's his billionaire friends who need help. Will the government finally stand up for workers and maintain all safeguards for the steel industry permanently? Minister Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we believe it's very important to protect steel workers. We will continue with our approach of working with the steel industry. And we will continue to consider the ways that we can protect the industry. It's something that's very important for the 23,000 employees, of course, but it's also important for the future of the entire sector. The Honourable Member for Pierre Fondolard. Mr. Speaker, flooding in four provinces have had devastating effects on many communities, including mine. They continue to destroy houses, roads, and communities. Tits. We see our neighbours stepping up and our first responders working hard to keep us safe. Can the Minister of Public Safety please update the House on how the government is supporting Canadians who are being affected by the flooding? Minister. 
Our job as the federal government is to respond quickly to every provincial request for help. Provincial counterparts and we're working seamlessly together. Since receiving requests from New Brunswick, Ontario and Quebec, some 2,000 Canadian Armed Forces personnel have been deployed. They've been crucial in assisting with evacuations, sandbagging and other duties. The Coast Guard, DFO, Indigenous Services, Environment Canada, Natural Resources Canada, Public Safety Canada, Transport Canada and Revenue Canada and thousands of volunteers are working their hearts out to keep everyone safe. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, the Ethics Commissioner found the Prime Minister violated the Conflict of Interest Act, accepting an illegal vacation seen as a gift designed to influence the PM. This past week, a federal court ruled the lobbying commissioner must also investigate this illegal vacation. Now the Liberals are fighting that order. Shame. Mr. Speaker, why is the government spending public money trying to cover up the Prime Minister's illegal holiday? Purple Government House Leader. As I have said on numerous occasions in this House, we support the independence of officers of Parliament. As we all know, the lob lobbying commissioner investigates lobbyists. As the interpretation of the act continues to be considered by the courts, we will not comment. Mr. Speaker, I can assure all members, as well as all Canadians, that the Prime Minister and his office were not part of the decision to appeal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Alors. Order. The Honourable Member for Lévis Lobinière. Mr. Speaker, the investigation into the Prime Minister's illegal vacation will undoubtedly be delayed since the Liberals are appealing the judge's decision. It's clear that the Liberal government only respects our justice system if they can cheat it or profit from it. Mr. Speaker, we should be protecting trust in our justice system, which is so valuable. So why won't the Prime Minister set an example for all Canadians? Oh. <laughs> The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we support the independence of officers of Parliament. As we know, the lobbying commissioner is investigating. The interpretation of the law continues to be considered by the courts, and therefore we will not be commenting on the decision on, on, on this uh, issue. The decision was made independently by the Prime Minister in his office. Thank you. Okay, the, Lévy the Honourable Member for Lévy Lobinière. Mr. Speaker, a friend is a friend, but a liberal friend is special. A liberal friend gets a contract without going through a call for tenders. The Department of Justice worked to ensure that a lawyer with links to the Liberal Party of Canada got a consulting contract worth $711 per hour. And what a coincidence, the lawyer is a fundraiser for the Liberal Party. Mr. Speaker, what are the Liberals hiding from Canadians here? Is it a new scandal? Hello. <laughs> Order. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I can reassure the Honourable Member, this House and all Canadians that all of the rules were followed in this case. There are a number of law firms that do business with the Department of Justice. This was a decision that was uh, made internally and it followed all the rules, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Thornhill. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's get this straight. We have a Liberal connected law firm initially offered a big contract without having to compete with other firms. Wow. The two lead lawyers, both regular contributors to the Liberal Party, one a former chief speechwriter for the Liberals, the other the Liberals' 2015 campaign lawyer. Although other firms were belatedly invited to bid, none did, and the Liberal connected firm got the big contract. Mr. Speaker, why is it with these Liberals, it's always who you know? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Said a moment ago in French, I can reassure the honourable member, I can reassure this House and all Canadians that this kind of contract, Mr. Speaker, was well within the power of 
the Deputy Minister and the Department to accord. They did so in a transparent process that followed all rules and regulations, Mr. Speaker. That firm, Mr. Speaker, is one of many firms that does work with our Justice Department. Order. The Honourable Member Allard. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Côte de Beaupré, uh, Lille d'Orléans, Charlevoix, uh, should come to order. Yes. Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, decades of liberal and conservative mismanagement of our fisheries has left Chinook salmon populations in a desperate situation. Instead of acting with urgency, liberals just keep reannouncing the same funding they promised for restoration, enhancement, and lost habitat protections. But the money's not flowing. The liberals can keep, can find four and a half billion dollars for their pipeline expansion, but they can't get the money out the door to support local fishers and communities affected by fisheries closures. Will the minister finally commit to immediately rolling out these necessary funds? What are they waiting for, Mr. Speaker? Minister of Fisheries. Mr. Speaker, I was very pleased to stand with Premier John Horgan about a month or so ago to announce the, the, the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund, which is $142 million focused on ha habitat restoration in British Columbia, the largest investment ever made in habitat restoration. We have expedited the process to ensure that we are taking in uh, 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 applications with respect to, to that fund, and we will be commencing uh, decisions on those by early June. I think that a two-and-a-half-month period to solicit applications and to make decisions is a pretty darn fast pretty period of time. Fair, yeah. Honourable member for North Island, Powell River. Well, waiting for that announcement certainly took a lot of time when wild exactly. salmon on our coastline are yeah. suffering every single day. And we have known this, and we've known this for years. But the Liberals had a consultation process that was shoddy at best. The late announcement left small businesses scrambling. This problem is the result of decades of mismanagement and broken Liberal promises on habitat restoration. Hatcheries along along the coast have not seen an increase in funding for over 35 years. Whoa. So they've got 12 million for Loblaws fridges. Where is the money <laughs> for the hatcheries? So when will this government take responsibility and stop? The Honourable <laughs> Minister of Fisheries. Mr. Speaker, addressing the decline in uh, Fraser River Chinook is obviously a complicated process. It involves money going into habitat restoration, which we announced with Premier Horgan of British Columbia. It involves the new Fisheries Act, which provides, uh, bring, brings back the lost protections that were lost under the previous Conservative government. It focuses on in, ensuring that appropriate fisheries management is taking place, which was the announcement I made last week. It also focuses on ensuring that we're discussing issues relating to supplementation in hatcheries, which is a, an issue that, that there are certainly pros and cons associated with that from a science perspective. We are engaging that conversation with the recreational fishery, and we will continue to do so. Honourable Member for Charlesbourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the Liberals will never change. Last week, we learned that they're selling access to the Prime Minister and the Minister of Innovation. They sold a ticket for a Liberal fundraiser to the president of a U.S. marijuana company. Then they refunded the money because, turns out, that's illegal. But the Prime Minister said, no problem, I'll introduce you, President of the company, to the Minister of Innovation. So we want to know when the Minister of Innovation will be meeting with the uh, President of this company. As my colleague knows, we have introduced new legislation uh, concerning political donations. They're more transparent and more open. It's important that everyone follows those rules, and that's why we're here. And I'm very proud of this uh, legislation. Thank you. Honorable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government's been caught red-handed in another illegal cash for access scandal. American CEO Ian Jenkins attended a $1,600 a ticket Liberal fundraiser. Now, it's illegal for Americans to donate to Canadian politicians, but Jenkins boasted about being there. He got a picture with the Prime Minister who said he'd open doors of access to the Minister of Immigration, of Innovation, actually, Mr. Speaker. Talk about a thank you for your donation. Yeah. Why does the Prime Minister continue to give preferred access to the wealthy and well-connected as long as they pony up to the Liberal Party of Canada? Right. Uh, Minister of Democratic Institutions. Mr. Speaker, 
Speaker, as my honourable colleague in the opposition knows, we introduced Bill C-50, which made it more transparent when coming to fundraising events here in Canada. It's precisely why events that are attended by the Prime Minister, ministers or the leaders of the parties represented in this House are made publicly available, as well as those who attended. And that's very important for transparency purposes in Canada. Thank you, Perfect. Mr. Speaker. Perfect. Honourable <laughs> member for Chilliwack Hope. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals only paid back the illegal donation after they were caught, and now their story is that this American CEO was gifted the ticket from another Liberal donor who was also in attendance at the event. Of course, that would mean that that person gave $3,200 to the Liberal Party of Canada, something that is also illegal. But of course, to Liberals, it's only illegal if you get caught, and if you don't, it's thank you for your donation. Why does, when it comes to the Prime Minister's own behaviour, does he find it so hard to follow ethical guidelines. The Honourable Minister of Democratic Institutions. Mr. Speaker, and I will remind my Honourable colleague that even before this legislation came into effect in January of this year, the Liberal Party began disclosing their events and began disclosing the participants, something the Leader of the Opposition didn't do, Mr. Speaker, and we can only ask why. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington Order. Mr. Speaker, it's been a year since the leader of the party opposite promised Canadians a climate plan. Oh, yeah. 365 days later, and the Conservatives still have no plan. Oh. Canadians can't afford politicians who ignore climate change. Here. Order. Order. I remind that member uh, not to use uh, personal names in the House. I ask him to finish his uh, order. The honourable member. start over? Yeah. Canadians can't afford politicians who ignore climate change. They expect us to lead the fight against climate change to protect Canadians and our communities. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment tell this House how our government is taking real action while the opposition continues? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Official opposition, a happy anniversary. It was one year ago today that he committed to bring forward a plan that would actually meet the Paris Agreement targets. He can't bring himself to even talk about that plan or the Paris Agreement anymore. Mr. Speaker, while we move forward with the climate plan, the Conservatives are busy meeting behind closed doors with wealthy executives to discuss how they can take less action on climate change. It is reprehensible, Mr. Speaker. We are putting a price on pollution. We're taking plastics out of our ocean. We're investing in public transit and make life more affordable and more efficient for Canadians. Mr. Speaker, Canadians want action on climate change. I invite the Leader of the Opposition to take note. Yes. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government, through a trusted and respected Manitoba Chief Justice, under the bus for callous political reasons. The Liberals leaked Justice Joy Al's confidential application to the Supreme Court, and now they're under investigation by the Privacy Commissioner. They trampled on his rights and slandered his good name. Also, they could trash the reputation of the former Justice Minister. Will the current Justice Minister confirm if he or his office have been contacted by the Privacy Commissioner regarding this leak? Here, here, here. Well, Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, our government has taken significant steps to ensure that the process for appointing judges is transparent and accountable to Canadians and promotes a greater diversity on the bench. Mr. Speaker, our new process is effective. To date, we have appointed or elevated over 290 judges, Mr. Speaker, and the diversity of these judges and the diversity of the bench is becoming an, an un unprecedented 55%. Mr. Speaker, of these judicial appointments are, are women. We'll continue to ensure that our process is merit-based, that it's secure, and that confidentiality and the opinions given in confidence are, are secure. Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our thoughts are with all those people who are affected by flooding in Quebec, Ontario, and New Brunswick. Unfortunately, we know that with climate change, these types of things will be ever more common. And flood mapping in many areas is out of date. 
A $200 million fund has been set up to help the provinces solve the problem. So far, Quebec hasn't been able to benefit from it. Will the federal government commit to working with the provinces to ensure that the program meets their needs and, most of all, to ensure that the money remains available for as long as necessary? Public safety. The disaster mitigation program uh, has been in place for uh, the last number of years, and a number of provinces and municipalities have taken advantage of the uh, of the program. Uh, it's now in its uh, final days. The government will have to make a decision in the future about whether the program will continue. But the honourable gentleman makes an important point that uh, flood mapping. Uh, is an extremely important priority. There is huge expertise within the Department of Natural Resources and the Government of Canada, and we will do our very best to collaborate with provinces and municipalities to make sure that service is appropriately available across the country. Honourable Member for Sydney Victoria. Mr. Speaker, our trade committee has been very active over the past few years with many trade agreements that our government has ratified. We understand the importance of these agreements, not only to our businesses, but for all Canadians. The CPTPP will help us access new markets to millions of consumers. This weekend, the Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, welcomed the Japanese Prime Minister to Canada, where they reconfirmed the strength of our bilateral relationship. And it was a good one. Can the Minister of International Trade and Diversification please update this House on the successes of this agreement and our trade strategy? Minister of International Trade Diversification. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague from Sydney, Victoria, for his leadership and for all of his work on the Trade Committee. While it's still early, I am delighted to report that the results are nothing short of outstanding. Canada's exports of dutiable products to Japan have risen by 17.1% in January and February. And some Canadian beef exports have doubled compared to last year. Our trade diversification strategy is working. We are creating wealth. We are creating new markets and new jobs for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. A month ago, the Prime Minister threatened to sue the leader of the official opposition for telling Canadians the truth about his role in the SNC-Lavalin scandal. At the time, the leader of the opposition said he would see the Prime Minister in court. Well, the opposition leader is still waiting, waiting for the suit to be filed, waiting for a trial to start, and waiting for the Prime Minister to take the stand and testify under oath. Will the Prime Minister tell Canadians when he will follow through on his threats and testify under oath in the SNC-Lavalin scandal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as the member knows very well, and I've answered on numerous occasions, is that the leader of the official opposition has actually been served notice on numerous occasions. And what he does is he changes his wording, he deletes tweets, and then he steps out with a new narrative and believes that that is all of a sudden his new truth. But Mr. Speaker, what's important to note is that what Canadians have been voting, waiting for for 365 days is a climate plan from the Conservatives. So rather than worry about, you know, politics. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member Order. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, I don't need to tell members of this House that this country is in the midst of a climate emergency. We are seeing flooding throughout Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, killer windstorms in British Columbia in the winter, and forest fires in the summer. What we don't need is to weaken the already inadequate plan that we have from the federal government. So I'd like assurances that Canada will stand firm on our equivalency agreement for vehicles emission standards with the state of California, no matter what the White House does. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the honourable member pointed out, climate change is real and, and the consequences are, are too great to ignore. We know that transportation accounts for almost a quarter of Canada's emissions and smart fuel efficiency rules for cars and light trucks is going to help reduce those emissions. When we first adopted our rules and, uh, under the previous government in 2014, we actually made a commitment to review those in light of the review that was going uh, on in the U.S. We're partway through that right now and we're going to be carefully considering environmental and economic impacts as we make policy that's based here in Canada, not south of the border in Washington. The Honourable Member for Brampton East. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, many young Canadians dream of owning a home, but that dream is becoming more difficult each and every single day. Many residents are concerned about the mortgage stress test <coughs> rules and the impact that they're having on owning a home, and at the continued slowdown of our real estate markets across this country. Can the Finance Minister please update this House on what measures he and this government are taking to make home ownership more affordable for all Canadians? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Finance. We know how important it is for Canadians that they have the opportunity to meet up to their dream of buying a home. We can see that we need to try and make sure that we keep the market stable, which we've been working to do, but at the same time create opportunities for people to step forward and purchase a home. And that's why in this year's budget we actually had two important measures. One, for some Canadians, they will have the access to their RSP increased if they have such capacity. For other Canadians, we have a first-time home buyer's incentive, and that will allow people to be able to take a lower mortgage as they purchase their first home, giving access for many more Canadians the possibility of their first home. The Honourable Member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, uh, terrible floods are afflicting Canadians. Uh, across the country, including in my riding of Perry Sound, Muskoka. And while we appreciate the short-term efforts, there's also long-term solutions that have to be deployed. One of these is the one trillion tree movement around the globe to plant a trillion trees uh, across the world, Mr. Speaker. This is a realistic plan to reduce emissions by uh, 10 years' worth of emissions, to prevent flooding, and to increase biodiversity. Can the Government of Canada, instead of, instead of these endless debates about taxing people more, why don't we sign on to the trillion tree movement and make a real difference for people. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the uh, irony of the question, uh, given the recent decision by the Ontario uh, Conservative government to act the, uh, the program that would see 50 million trees planted, is not lost on me. Uh, we, our plan to fight climate is not just uh, to put a price on pollution and put more money in the pockets of Canadians. It includes making record investments in public transit, making sure that 90% of our electricity is generated from clean re resources by 2030, phasing out coal on the same schedule, making investments in green energy and green infrastructure. Structure. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the urgency and the member's question. The time to act is now. If only the Conservatives would realize that, we'd all be better off. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Member on a point of order. Mr. Speaker. I'm sure I will get unanimous consent of the House to adopt the following motion, that this House denounce the Government of Canada's decision to refuse the entry to Quebec of Mr. Carlos Puigdemont. The, the Honourable Member does...